Okay, according to my phone anyway, it is 12.03, so let's get started. I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So uh, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is Dean McEwen. I'm the, the director of the MMA Blended um, cohort for this program. And um, again, you know, thank you for uh, taking time out of your day to uh, come and listen about the MMA program and, and what we have to offer. Um, just a couple of uh, sort of housekeeping things. We do have the Q&A panel. Um, my colleague Alex is here and Alex is going to be um, answering some of those questions as you put them in. So feel free to enter them in, you know, during the, the, the presentation and that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then if um, Alex might actually save a couple. So if you've entered your question in and it hasn't been answered, um, he might save it for me to answer for everybody to see or hear um, towards the end of the program. So we'll do that. But um, anyway, that should be uh, that should be a good way of doing it. So again, um, just to clarify, you're here for the Master of Management Analytics program offered by Smith School of Business. And I should mention too that there will be a recording of this session as well and gets posted to our YouTube channel later on. Um, in a few days. So um, the first thing uh, at Smith and at Queens, we always like to do a, a land acknowledgement. Um, land acknowledgements, if you, if you don't know, they're a way that people insert and build an awareness of Indigenous presence and land rights in our everyday lives. Um, they recognize the history of colonialism and First Nations, as well as the need for change in settler colonial societies. You know, I'm because I'm the director of the blended program, I started to sort of research uh, which Indigenous communities I should include in my land acknowledgement. And honestly, our program includes students from across Canada. We touch all three oceans. And this map sort of shows what I discovered, right? The depth, the breadth and the reach of Indigenous communities in Canada. So, you know, it's, it's not easy just to say, hey, you know what, we're, uh, we're, we're working and living and playing on these specific lands. So um, that's why I want to have this map so you can sort of see the breadth of, of what's going on and all the different communities that we, we work with. Um, so my, my land acknowledgement is also a little bit differently. So I want you to think, you know, a little bit more critically and comprehensively about Indigenous history, especially where where we and you live, learn, and play. And I would encourage you to discover, you know, which Indigenous lands you live on and what do you know about this territory and what do you know about the Indigenous culture? So, like, for example, like the events that happen there, the traditions, the knowledge that might be unique to your area. And I also encourage everyone to read and develop an understanding of the 94 calls of action identified in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's findings. You know, I personally have made every effort to learn about these actions, and I know I can make a difference by supporting call number 57, which is learning about Indigenous peoples, not only educating myself, but encouraging others to learn as well. And although I'm not an expert, you know, I'm happy to share the resources that I've used in my own journey here. Um, and also the 93rd call to action asks newcomers to Canada to learn about the Indigenous people in Canada. And I would certainly encourage you to learn about their traditions and ways of knowing sort of as you build a new life here in Canada. Okay. So getting back to Masters of Management Analytics. So we consider, or at least I consider this to be the significant business degree for today's managers. Um, the degree itself or the program is a full master's degree. It takes 12 months to complete. It is a, an actual master's degree offered by a university. So you can expect significant academic rigor as you study. This is not a situation where you just pay your money and you get your paper. Um, you will actually have to prove yourself and prove the levels of knowledge that you've got in this program. So we do have exams, we have assignments, we have team projects and lots of presentations in the program as well. So you will actually have to work fairly hard um, to get this degree. Now, why we say it, it's the business degree? Because it can really help launch your career in today's world, especially now that we're coming out of the pandemic. As you can imagine, right, most of the data and the models and things that we've been using in business for the past five years everything has been disrupted. We need to build and tweak new models. We need to think about new types of data that we're gathering. And so this is an opportunity for people like yourself 
to build upon those strengths that you have and sort of overcome some of your weaknesses by learning effectively with other people and trying the new things, right? This is all about uh, you and your career helping the digital transformation of your organization, right? And so through that, and hopefully you'll understand this through my presentation today, that the technology is one piece of this, but technology changes all the time. The one thing that doesn't change is people, right? And you're working with people, you're communicating with people, your teamwork with people. That's one of those common elements. So you have to be able to identify and have a good understanding of both the people and the technology in order to make analytics work for your company. Um, one of the great things about, again, well, a positive that kind of came out of the pandemic is that we now offer the MMA program in a blended fashion. Um, and so I'll talk about that a little bit further, but if you're not in the greater Toronto area and you don't have access to our Toronto classroom to take the MMA program in person, we do offer it in blended or remotely. So in the blended program, we do have students from across Canada. Now, what is analytics and stuff? So one of the things about this program is really um, sort of helping you understand what it takes to be successful using data in your everyday decision making at your organization. And so one of the main foundations of that is actually having verified and trusted data. That is the number one foundation. There's no point in even thinking about going towards the progressive analytics that we're gonna talk about or even into artificial intelligence and automated decision making without having the trusted data. You've gotta have a good understanding of how do you find data? Where do you find data? How do you verify it? And then how do you use it? And that's sort of the pieces that we're going to be looking at in this program. Now, what is analytics Excel? So as I mentioned on the previous screen, there's four different types of analytics. And so we are going to cover all four types in this program as well, because each type is very valuable. OK, and there's not one type that's better than the other types. It all really depends on the business problem that you're trying to solve and what kind of analytics you want. So for example, descriptive analytics. So if you think about a dashboard, right? Everyone uses Power BI, or not everybody, but a lot of people use Power BI to build dashboards and business intelligence. You wanna understand, you know, what did I do today? What kind of progress did we make? How many sales did we make? That kind of stuff. So that's about what happened. Of course, nobody is really ever ha happy with just knowing what happened yesterday or today. We wanna know what's gonna happen in the future, right? So that's where predictive analytics comes into play. And this is where we can develop different types of models um, to sort of guess on what's going to happen in the future. But as we've seen with the pandemic, uh, those models, they're faulty, right? Because there's always unknown variables in there that can mess up your model. And so you really wanna to get to a situation where you're thinking about prescriptive analytics. And this is how you make it happen. This is how do you optimize your operations to ensure you have a positive outcome. And so using prescriptive analytics, you're studying the data and you're making business decisions and then you're actually actioning something after that. So um, the example that I always use with prescriptive analytics is like dynamic pricing. And we actually have a whole course in dynamic pricing in the program because it's so effective. Um, when you think about an airplane, right? When an airplane, it literally is, when it flies, let's say from Toronto to Amsterdam, an airplane is a fixed cost operation, right? You know how much gas you're gonna use. You know the cost and maintenance of the airplane. You know the cost of the personnel that are gonna be flying it and working on the airplane. You also know the number of seats that are on that airplane. So anytime an airplane leaves an airport and there's an empty or unsold seat, that is revenue that's lost to the organization. So airlines now use dynamic pricing to make sure that they actually sell every single seat on that airplane before it takes off, because that's how you maximize your revenue. Even if you're selling that seat for five to 10 bucks, it's still more revenue than you would have had if that seat was empty. And so companies now use prescriptive analytics. They can analyze the data in real time. They understand the data from people like looking at flights, who's going where, when, they know customer data from the previous like decade, then they can really play it out and use analytics to understand the patterns in consumer behavior. Who's gonna buy tickets? How often they're gonna buy the tickets? When are they gonna go? What's their preferred time? 
and where their preferred locations. And so you can optimize that as an airline because you can actually, if there's not that much demand, you can change the size of the airplane. Uh, if there is lots of demand and there's you know very little supply, you can increase the price to back to maximize your revenue and make sure those seats are full. If there's no demand and there's lots of empty seats, you lower your price and then you fill it up again. So those are all important concepts to understand in, in prescriptive analytics. But ultimately, when you're thinking about pricing of airline tickets, for example, you can't have a person sitting there adjusting the price, doing the analysis, and then looking at the, the supply and demand, and then adjusting the price. You can't do that. You have to be able to develop a computerized system or an artificially intelligent system that uses things like uh, machine learning to be able to do the analysis very quickly, set the prices very quickly, and adjust as the seats are sold, right? It's really important that you adjust that price back up. If there's a big run on the seat, you want to maximize your revenue. It's important you do that. And people just get in the way, right? You need an automated system to be able to do that. And that's where AI or cognitive analytics comes into play. Now, back to the program itself. So we are a business school, okay, offering this very technical program. We've actually been offering it for 10 years now. This is our 10th anniversary in uh, 2023. We started it back in 2013. There have been a lot of iterations. The technology has changed dramatically over those 10 years. Uh, we used to be a very much a no code kind of analytics program, whereas nowadays we do a lot of Python programming. Um, and so, and then that again is probably going to change over the next two to three years as well when you've got systems out there that are writing code for you. And so we'll see where that leads us. But today we do use Python in the program. And we also have a very much a broader approach to solving these problems through data analysis. So the broader approach is really thinking about what is the problem that the business is trying to solve? That's the key. We want to understand that. We don't do analytics for the sake of analytics. We do it to help solve a problem. The analytics is a tool within the program. So the business turns around and says, hey, you know what? We're having trouble filling the seats on this airplane. So that's the problem. We think about that root cause of that and we can say, we can come up with a hypothesis and say, oh, I think that the, you know, the price is just too high for flights to Amsterdam that leave at two o'clock in the afternoon, right? Because people wanna do a red eye thing and fly overnight. So the eight o'clock flight is much better. So let's adjust the pricing on that to think about that. So when we develop a hypothesis, we think about the data that we're going to need. We actually build the system and run the analysis that we want. And then we test and learn that. We want to say, okay, did this actually meet the needs um, to solve this problem? Can we make decisions now that are appropriate for this? And if not, we start the process again. We develop a new hypothesis. We look for new algorithms. We look for new data. And these are the things we'll be looking at in the program. Um, and then also, as I mentioned at the top there, about people, right? You have to be able to work effectively with people. It's one thing to do the technology piece and to be able to write good code and to be able to you know, develop a nice model. But if you can't communicate that to people, if you can't link it effectively, tell the story right, of how it solves your business problem, um, you're going to have trouble with that. So we look at that in this program too, because it's a team-based program. Now, these are the actual courses that we offer. Um, as you can see, there's basically three types of courses. So we have method courses where we teach you how to do analytics. We have application courses where we teach you how to do analytics in marketing, finance, operations, and supply chain. And then we have what we call power skill courses. And that gets us back to our business school roots, right? So we have AI and ethics, which is becoming extremely important as these AI systems become that much more powerful and more creative on their own. We have to be able to control them a little bit. We have to be able to understand the decision-making process of how do we build these systems and how do we operationalize them. Uh, we also have leading change, which is all about developing a strategy and a vision, and then understanding how to communicate or how to get allies for your to support you as you're pushing forward with new decision-making ideas and new systems out there. And then we have other elective courses like analytics project leadership, and we also have entrepreneurship and innovation. So those are electives. So you get to choose one or the other. And it really is about your personal path, right? Do I want to work in a, a larger corporate environment where I'm going to be you know, literally managing projects? 
Or do I want to think about doing something more of a startup? I want to have something totally new and creative. And that's where entrepreneurship and innovation comes into play. Now, we do have two different delivery methods, okay, for this program as well. So if you live in Toronto and the GTA, we have an in-person format. So we have a classroom facility at the corner of Simcoe and Front Street West. And in there, we have, uh, we actually have three classrooms in that uh, facility. And so that program, we've got two different start dates, one in January, one in April. Uh, you basically come to class um, just like you would in undergrad days, one night every week, and then one weekend day bi-weekly for 12 months. And so let's, for example, it'd be Wednesday nights from 5.30 to 9.30, and then every other Saturday from 8.30 to 4.30. And you would do that for the full 12 months of the program. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the facility is there in, at Simcoe in front, so it's right across the road from the Metro Toronto Convention Centre, so it's super close to Union Station, super close to St. Andrew's Station for the subway, uh, and the GO is there and everything else, so it's, it's very easy to get to. And then included with this, there's also two one-week sessions that you actually have to come to Kingston for. Um, the idea there, each session is about one week. The first one is our opening session, and that's where we introduce you to high-performing teams and your teammates and your coaches and that sort of thing, plus you take a full course. And then the second week is our electives week. Again, you come back to Kingston. Now, the reason we do that is because we want you to just immerse yourself in the student experience, right? We know that if you stay at home and while you're taking these courses, Everybody, pretty much everybody is working full time as they take this program. And so we want you to leave all that behind. We want you to not have to worry about walking the dog or taking out the garbage. We want you to come here, be a student, work with your teams, work on the academic program or the courses that you're taking, and then just really be able to focus on stuff like that and not have to worry about home life, right? And work life and that sort of thing. And then throughout the, the entire program itself, we have a very substantial coaching and career support as well. So there's the team coaching and there's also career coaching and career coaching and career support comes down from everything from, we do have a job board. Um, I'll talk about this in a second, but there are coaches that can help you develop your ideas or your path for your own career as well. Now, um, since COVID, we've actually learned how to do this in a blended learning format as well. We call it blended learning for three main reasons. So one, the majority of your courses are done remotely over Zoom, but they are synchronous still. So you will, it'd be just like today's session um, where you have a professor is online with all of your fellow students, they're all online. We have breakout rooms. It's just like you're in a facility, but it's remote. So if you're in Vancouver, you can actually do this program from Vancouver. That's not a problem. Um, Blended has uh, right now has one start date in January each year. The, the blended part of it, again, is that you, so you get the synchronous lectures and, and classroom time. They're very interactive. You also have asynchronous content on our course website. So you'll have extra readings and things like that to do. And then it's also blended because we still have these, what we'll call this opening and closing sessions where they're done in person. And so, you know, you will come to Kingston for the opening session for one week. And there again, you'll learn about your teams, the high performing teams, you meet your coaches and you start working on your courses. And then we have a closing session which will be in Toronto. And so that becomes a bit more of a social one. There's still a course to take in that, but it's also in person. And so that's why we call it blended. So you've got this in-person, you've got remote, and you've got both synchronous and asynchronous delivery. Uh, with the blended learning format, you still have full access to the coaching that goes on through the teams, but also the career coaching stuff as well. Now, um, I've mentioned before, we're a business school teaching a technical program. So this, these are some of the technologies that we use in the program as well. So we've got Databricks and Python, SQL, Azure, SAS, Snowflake, Tableau, all of these tools. The, the program itself is officially tool agnostic. So really, we're not going to be using these tools intricately in the courses themselves. But you, as an analytics professional, 
and leverage these tools, whatever tool you're most comfortable with. But we also have academic licensing for all this stuff too. So through the academic licensing, we have access to all of the, the teaching and the learning opportunities, the digital badges, you know, Python, Databricks, um, Microsoft Azure. I mean, they've all got online learning programs and, and the digital badges that go along with it. SAS, same thing, Tableau. Um, so you can get that kind of stuff and you can really use the tools that you're most comfortable with in the program and, and go forth. But we have all the resources for you to be successful. And then who's teaching? So here's a, a quick um, snapshot of four of our you know, tenure track faculty members from the school. Um, they all have exceptional credentials. We do actually bring in some adjunct faculty to teach in this program as well. And the primary reason there, it's usually in our, like our application type courses because they've actually got knowledge and experience doing something like finance and analytics in the finance world, right? Whether they've been in capital markets or something like that, but they've actually done that uh, and done that experience and they can bring that experience into the classroom as well. So you know that this isn't just theoretical, it's not just textbook learning, but these are actual uh, real experiences. And the same thing goes for most you know, business professors. They do a lot of um, consulting on the side. So they have a lot of interaction with different companies and they can bring that knowledge into the classroom as well. And overseeing this whole thing, we have this uh, great analytics and AI advisory board. So these are just three people, uh, Mark Schaefer from Disney, he's the chair of our board. Uh, Gary Kearns actually teaches in some of the sections of the program as well. And Lori Vieta from Bank of Montreal. Um, these people provide us with the advice and the guidance to make sure that our program, our curriculum, and our course content is relevant to the companies that are hiring our students and, and working with analytics as well. What's the latest and greatest thing you're seeing at Disney, for example? Um, they'll bring that to our advisory board, make sure we know about that, and then we can then take that and apply it to our programs themselves. Now, as a student in the program, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that the majority of our students are working full time as they take this program, um, but there are a lot of other things you can get involved in as well. So, as I mentioned before, the technical workshops, <clears throat> we do run different types of workshops um, on Databricks and Snowflake and, and SAS, and Tableau and, and Power BI, that kind of stuff. But we also have professional workshops, right? Having difficult conversations, communication styles, uh, presentation styles, that sort of thing. And there's a number of clubs, right? Every cohort gets their own student leadership opportunities. So they have like a student government. And so it's an opportunity for you to, you know, join the student government, help um, be that sort of <clears throat> that bridge, you know, between the administration of the program and the students themselves doing social events and stuff. We give the student leaderships a bit of a budget to run socials and stuff and have some fun. And then there's also the Smith Business Club, which is actually an alumni organization. So you interact with our alumni group, uh, of which now we've got, I don't know, there's like 16 or 1700 alumni who all have the Smith MMA degree. And so they run a number of events throughout the year as well. And then we also have some cross-program um, clubs and groups. We have our Scotiabank Center for Customer Analytics. So, you know, that's an opportunity to get involved with some research if you want to do research or hear about, you know, what's going on and the research side of things as well. Coop is a Queen's University Alternate Asset Fund. So it's an actual real money fund that um, you can join um, that operations committee and actually invest money and see how it works. And that's really um, analytics has become extremely important to that as well over the past few years. And then we have our, our cross program equity, diversity and inclusivity uh, group as well. Same kind of deal. You know, this is a group that sort of makes sure that EDII initiatives are at the forefront of what the school is doing, but also the student body as well. And they bring in speakers and panels, talks and that kind of stuff. So, you know, extremely important for sure. Now, who is going to be in the class with you? <clears throat> so it doesn't really matter which uh, cohort you're in, whether it's blended or in person. Um, our classes usually look about the same um, demographic wise. Uh, we do have an average age of around 32. But it's the range that's really interesting here. So we do have people coming in. We have a minimum work experience of two years. 
So we do have some students who come in at 22. Um, and last year, the, the oldest person in the program was 52. Uh, but we have had people into their 60s before in this program. And what you get there is you get the young people come in with the great technical acumen, the understanding of social media, the understanding of what kind of data might exist out there. And then you get the, the older people who come in with the business knowledge, right? The political acumen. Um, quite often, they're actually building their own analytics team. So they hire from the program themselves. And so you get this nice blend. So this adds to the diversity of the classroom, which is very, very useful to make sure that everyone kind of understands where different people come from. And it brings out the power of a team and the diversity of teams. Um, and then, you know, when you graduate from our program, you know, we're a business school. So we have a tremendous alumni network. You can see there's over 25,000 Smith alumni. Uh, it seems to me that they're in pretty much every country in the world as well. So wherever you go, you're going to come across a Smith or a Queens alumnus. Um, we've got, uh, you know, MMA alumni now is over 1,200, but actually that was um, no longer accurate because I know we're up for over 1,600 now. We've been running, you know, five cohorts of MMA students for the past couple of years. So um, we're getting uh, much bigger numbers for that. Now, as a student as well, you have access to our career management framework. Um, one of the important things to think about here is that, and we call it career, not just job, right? right? So even if you are comfortable in your current organization, you see yourself getting promoted and working your way up inside, let's say Scotiabank, for example, our career coaches can help you with that path to say, okay, where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as an executive VP or do you want to get up to the C-suite? And they can guide you and give you some points that you really should try to achieve and what kind of time frame and stuff you're going to work with um, to make sure you're doing that. But if you are thinking about different jobs and you do want sort of <clears throat> more money and more responsibility and that kind of stuff as well, we do have a full job board. We have um, career coaching and tutorials on things like resume writing, cover letter writing, uh, interview skills, um, all of those sorts of things as well. So it really is a full service sort of opportunity to understand what's going on. We have a whole team of people who are like business development representatives with different companies. And we get to a point now where um, when a company has a need for someone, especially in, in this kind of a professional master's program where you know, it's not your standard sort of career or campus recruitment kind of stuff. Um, companies will come to us and say, hey, we need someone with, let's say, 10 to 15 years of experience around the analytic space. We know that they're coming out of a top-notch program. Can you recommend to us a couple of names of people? And we actually have a resume book as well, which we encourage all of our students to put their resumes in that book. And that book and those resumes can be shared with those companies that say we need something specific. So quite often jobs aren't even posted anymore. Uh, they just come to us with a need. We'll give them a list of people or a list of students that they should reach out to. And then those jobs, um, people get matched up and go through the regular interview process. So again, a great opportunity. It's a very different world. There's a lot of demand for analytics people. And so, you know, networking and personality and that kind of stuff becomes extremely important. Now in the program as well, there's this option um, to do or pursue other professional certifications. So these are three. Um, the key here is that none of these are an automatic from this program. You will have to do something along with what you've been learning in the program. So for example, SAS has uh, exams that you have to write. <clears throat> so you can, you know, you'll have access to all the academic resources to do your predictive model or certification, but you'll have to write that exam and pass the exam. We can't help you with that. Same thing with INFORMS and the Certified Analytics Professional. There's both an exam Plus, there's also work experience. So you have to be doing analytics, I think it's like for five years before you can get the, the CAP certification. And that's similar to the Project Management Institute as well. So if you want to get your PMP, um, basically you should have to take our, our project leadership course, plus you're going to have to get some other real experience, plus you're going to have an exam to write as well. So there's a lot of work, but definitely 
our program and the content and the curriculum can lead you to these certifications if you choose to pursue them. Now, this is a master's degree, so it is important that you have uh, an undergraduate degree from a recognized university. We will ask for official transcripts. Um, and if you are, if your undergraduate degree was in a university outside of Canada, we will ask for a WES detail assessment just to confirm that you have that degree. These are requirements that we have from the Ontario government. And so it's important that we get all of that administrative you know, bureaucratic um, stuff as part of your application as well. So think about that. Um, there's a lot of math, stats, formulas, stuff like that. Okay. So you should be comfortable with quantitative analysis before you think about joining this program. You will have to do that. Uh, every single course has an individual assessment component that you must pass uh, in order to get the degree. So you will have to prove that you can do the math and the stats in this during exams and that kind of stuff as well. So, so it's really important that, you know, if quants or stats and math are just something that, you know, you're not comfortable doing, then really this probably isn't the program for you. But if you're okay with that, if you want to learn because your stats course was, you know, 10 years ago and you need to refresh it, we'll run you through a stats course that's online, like a preliminary one before the program starts. And then, of course, we have a course to teach you that as well. So you'll have those fund fundamental pieces that you'll be able to build on for sure. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but we do require you to have a minimum of two years work experience. Um, there have been a couple of occasions where, you know, an exceptional applicant will come along, somebody maybe who's been doing analytics or AI development or something on the side during their undergrad, and they've been doing lots of internships or co-ops or something like that. And so we'll look at that. So we might consider you, but um, the program itself is quite popular and quite difficult to get into. So, uh, you know, you should really have that two years of work experience. And, you know, I'm happy to talk to you on an individual basis about that as well, if you're not too sure. And you can also think about the two years work experience is when the program starts. So, for example, um, if you graduated in June 2021 and you applied today, um, you know, it doesn't look like you actually have two years work experience. But the program doesn't start until January. So that stretches it out and you've got two and a half years of experience by the time you get there. Uh, we also want letters of reference. They do not have to be academic references. Um, what we would like to see is one supervisor and then one coworker uh, provide you with references. And that's a form, it, it is confidential. So um, you send us the email address and the name of the person, then we send a confidential form to them. They fill it out. Uh, you don't actually see it, but um, we'll have those references. And again, that's a requirement for the program. We will need official transcripts from your undergraduate institution. Um, again, if your undergrad was outside of Canada, you know, there might be an opportunity or it might be a challenge to get that official transcript. And that's where the WES uh, detailed assessment comes into play. To start the application, we just need a cover letter and a resume, right? We want to know who you are, quick introduction, um, and we can use that. And once we get that information, we can get you an application advisor and get going on that. Ultimately, when we get up, all that information comes in. We will do an interview. It's usually with the director of that cohort. Um, and, then, and then we have an admissions committee that makes the final decision. Um, one of the things that we found is that, you know, a lot of people at big business school, they want to write the GMAT. Um, we always kind of say, you know, the GMAT covers like grade 11 math. So that's really not going to be uh, a good indicator of your success in the program. So we want to talk to you before you start the GMAT. I personally would much rather have you studying to learn how to do Python programming, statistics and calculus, as opposed to uh, figuring out how to write a GMAT successfully. So always talk to us first, get us in that resume cover letter, start the process and then we can talk about the GMAT. Okay, and then once you do that, once you start with even an unofficial transcript and you have your resume, if you send that in, like on each of our websites, we have an introduce yourself form. Once you fill that in and you give us this information, 
then we can assign you an application advisor who will work with you on a personal basis. And they do also do a preliminary assessment. So they'll go through that information very quickly and they'll take a look and see if you have any needs or anything like that that should be worked on before you continue your application. Or they may turn around and say, yep, everything looks good. Let's start going. Let's get your references in here. Let's get the official transcripts and let you get to an interview with the director. Um, the application advisor is also your biggest advocate in this process as well. So you work closely with them, you develop a relationship with them, and then they will like literally sell you to me, the director, and say, this is a great applicant. You've got to interview them quickly. They're going to be great in the program. So it's really important to be attentive to your application advisor, work with them positively, and, uh, and they will help you um, all along. Now we do something a little bit different called rolling admission as well. We don't actually have any cutoff dates. The real, the only real cutoff date is when the program itself starts. Um, but so the challenge though, is that, you know, as we do rolling admission, so as your application is complete, we do the interview, we send out offers right away. Um, there's always this chance, right? That the program will fill up. And so for me with the blended program, I was running a wait list in October last year. So it's really important that you get this stuff. If you wanna start this in January, 2024, get your stuff in here quickly, um, get in the pipeline uh, and then hook up with the, the application advisor so that they can help you um, develop the strongest application you can because you, you, know, you don't necessarily wanna be put on the wait list especially for blended, there may not be another section starting for another year after that, right? So, um, you know, if you want to do it now, get the stuff in as quickly as possible. Now, this is an, an alternate pathway into the MMA program. So we have a, um, an agreement with um, edX and the MicroMasters program run through MIT. Um, so if you took this MicroMasters program in statistics and data science, uh, you would then get advanced credit for two courses that we offer. That's 863 or Introduction Analytic Modeling and 867 Predictive Modeling. And ultimately that would reduce your program fees. But, and this is the big but, um, the big but is that the MIT MicroMasters program, uh, the last time I looked, I'm not sure exact numbers, but it's I think it's about $3,500 American to take this program. So you're not probably going to save $3,500 American from our program fees by taking this. Plus the MicroMasters takes two years to complete. So you can actually do our entire degree in 12 months. Um, and plus you're not going to save that much money. So, you know, I would say, unless you have started the MicroMasters already, I would say, let's just do the application into our program as well. And so this is just something that, you know, Keep that in mind as you're going through. Uh, the MicroMasters program is, is great, but it is three courses plus an exam um, over two years. So it could take you a long time to actually get your degree. You do the MicroMasters, then you take our program. And so it would take you three years to get to the masters, whereas you can just jump right into our program and do it in one year. Now the fees um, for the program starting up uh, for domestic is 43,840. If you're an international student, it's 79,900 all Canadian dollars. Um, this is a program fee. So it does include all your tuition, all your books and learning materials, all your meals and accommodations for the sessions that we run here in Kingston, um, all the software licenses and all those sorts of expenses that you'll have. Um, basically what happens is for our, our opening and closing sessions, basically you travel to Kingston and you're responsible for that travel. Um, again, because people are coming from all over the place, we can't control how you travel. Um, but once you check into the hotel, then everything after that is on us, right? We'll feed you, we'll accommodate you, all that kind of stuff. So that's all included in your program fee as well. Um, the fee itself can be paid out over basically four installments. So you have your deposit. So once you get an offer to the program, when you sign that back and say, I accept the offer, we require a deposit of $2,000 to consider you enrolled. And then there's the three installment payments over the course of a year for the remaining amount of money. 
Okay. And so, and then the Queens does have a payment plan as well. So you can pay, I think it's monthly, but you have to sign up for that each term. Um, but we can help you with that too, if you're looking for different payment uh, possibilities. And then as far as financing your degree as well. So um, <clears throat> we do have a relationship with uh, Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. We can get a student line of credit there. Um, what I've found though, and through our experiences with a variety of students, is that the RBC student line of credit doesn't really give you a better deal, right? Like lower interest rates and like that than your other personal banks were. So um, most of the students that I've spoken to about this have always said, yeah, you just go to your own bank um, and you've already got that relationship and you will get as good of a deal with them as they will with RBC and stuff. So um, you can kind of keep that in mind. The MMA program is OSAP eligible. So OSAP is the Ontario Student Assistance Plan. And so if I student loans, um, it is OSAP eligible. So I definitely encourage you to apply for OSAP and see how much money you get. If you're from another province in Canada, same kind of deal. If the program is OSAP eligible, it's also usually eligible for your provincial student plan. And so I know it, it does work for Alberta and I think Manitoba for sure, because I've just done that with a couple of students. Um, but also I know BC, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, they all have their own plans um, that should be um, doable as well. Um, we do have a number of um, scholarship opportunities. I think we have an entrance scholarship, which is about $2,000. Um, to get that, that is based on your academic standing. And so you'd be looking at probably a 4.0 GPA um, to be considered for that kind of um, a scholarship. Uh, we also have entrance scholarships to encourage Black and Indigenous students to join our program as well. Um, so there's one for Black students, one for Indigenous students each year. And then we also work um, closely with the Vector Institute in Ontario. So um, there is the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence Scholarship. Um, that one is, is about $13,400, I believe. And the challenge there, though, is there's very strict deadlines. So you have to be enrolled in a program before you can apply for the Vector Scholarship. So uh, you'll have, if that's something you're interested in, you will have to manage your time very, very carefully and make sure you qualify for that. Okay, and this is just a, <clears throat> the reminder screen, right? That yes, this is about business. Um, we are a business school offering this technical degree. We know and we've seen that tremendous business value can be derived through analytics and the discovery of those insights that really help companies make decisions that help them solve their most pressing problems. We've seen this, but it's also important to realize that analytics is so much more than just data or just technology. Analytics is about people using those tools to help you develop solutions for those problems. So you still need a strong vision of what you're gonna use analytics for. <clears throat> you need to develop a strategy on how you're gonna go forward to it. You need to be a leader. You need to really think about how can I sort of garner support? How can I bring a team together to push this stuff forward to help my organization? And that's also gonna involve change management because anytime you support any kind of change, right? There's going to be some resistance. So it's important that you understand the change management function. How do I get those people to support me? How do I forget about the people who will never support me? And how do I go after that 20% uh, of those undecided people? And so we have a whole course in that, the leading change course. And effective collaboration, right? So we have our team structure in this program, and that's going to help you understand how to work with other people, how to practice different types of strategies for getting buy-in, keeping people focused, keeping people working towards that common goal. And that's really going to be important in developing your communication skills as well. And ultimately, what we're all pushing for is a new type of culture in Canadian business. Um, you, it's a digital culture, right? We no longer can go the way we used to do where we have, you know, traditional pillars of like finance, marketing, operations, we're going to be looking at problems that span those. They're cross-functional problems. We're going to be working on teams that are, again, cross-functional teams. And it's going to be really important for us as analytics professionals 
to understand what kind of data exists across those traditional pillars. How can I access that data and how can I use that to really build out the solutions that are going to help us make those decisions that are going to solve those big problems. So the next question is, are you ready? Are you ready to do this um, and join the program? The next start is in January. And so there seems to be a bit of time, but I do know that applications are strong right now. And so it's really important that you, you start your application as quickly as possible, get that information in. Um, I would particularly say, you know, focus on this now because you don't wanna get into the sort of the, what I would call the lazy days of summer where you might lose track of what's going on in July and August, right? So get started now, get on the right path, get your application in and then go from there. And hopefully I'll see you in the program in January. And then here's my, uh, my contact information. That QR code gets me to, or gets you to my LinkedIn profile. I'm happy to connect with you. Um, there's my email. If you have any other questions and that kind of stuff, um, feel free to, uh, to, to send me a note. Okay, now, so that's the end of that part. Um, now I'm gonna look at some of the Q and A's here. So uh, Santosh, uh, you say, what is the criteria for successful completion of MMA degree? Is there a final exam or project? So no, so what we do is we break it down into courses. So each course will have a final assignment, whether that's gonna be an exam or a project or a presentation. And uh, you'll have to do it that way. So you each course will have an individual assessment and a team assessment. And so they're usually about we're 50% each. And so you have to pass the individual assessment part in order to get the credit for that course. And then of course, working with your teammates, you'll get a total grade as well. So, so that's the key there is that you know each individual course has different assessments, some of them individual, some of them team-based and you have to be successful on both halves in order to be successful in the course, thereby successful in the program. Uh, is there a scholarship program available for the course? So I did mention that, I'll just mention it very quickly. The program is eligible for OSAP in Ontario. Uh, we have some limited um, entrance scholarships, right? So about $2,000 each, but you should have a GPA of at least 4.0 to be even considered for that. Um, and then we do have some uh, other scholarships for Black students and Indigenous students as well. Okay, is the program, uh, Ricardo says, is it uh, AACSB accredited? Yes, it is. Um, the school, so the AACSB accredits a school, um, not a program specifically. And so Smith School of Business is accredited under AACSB. Uh, is the program PGWP regardless if it's blended or in campus format? So unfortunately, I don't know what that acronym stands for. If you could uh, maybe type that in PGWP, um, I can answer that. Uh, what post, is the job? Postgraduate work permit, Dean. Oh, postgraduate. Oh, so yes. So um, yes, uh, yes for the in campus format. Um, no for the blended format. So basically because the blended program um, does not have any sort of residency requirements, right? So there's only like two weeks. So you wouldn't be eligible for a PGWP uh, postgraduate work permit for that purpose, okay? Yeah, so if you're an international student and you wanna stay in Canada and work, you should take the Toronto program. Uh, what is the job placement percentage for international students? So I'll be honest with you, I actually don't know the actual percentage of that um, because there's a whole bunch of different factors there, right? So um, A, uh, if you're an international student, if you're here on a work permit already, um, then you've already got a job, right? While you're in the program. Um, some people, especially in the blended program, we just mentioned about the, the postgraduate work permit, um, I get students, international students in my program who have no intention of coming to Canada. So they want to stay. So they stay in Saudi Arabia, China, um, India, Dubai, that kind of stuff, the, um, Eastern Europe as well. And so they have no intentions of coming to Canada. Um, and so they want to stay there. So um, 
yeah, it's so it's kind of a weird statistic to be looking for that. Um, what I always say, if people are interested in understanding what happens after the program itself, hop on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is like everybody's resume. You can very easily do a search for Smith School of Business MMA degree, and you can actually see where people are today. You can see their job progress. You can see when they graduated from the program, and you can take a look at all the different jobs that they've got. Um, I would say if you want to, if you're on there and you're looking for international students and you see a lot of people, um, you know, the different types of jobs, where they get those jobs, all that kind of stuff, all that information is in LinkedIn. And so I highly recommend you, you pop on there and do your own research. Uh, Daniel says, how many courses will I take in total or the length of the courses? Um, so basically there are, I think there's 14 courses in the program. Uh, we you do two courses per at a time, and each of those two courses lasts about eight weeks. So there's a little bit of fluctuation in there, a week here, a week there. Um, but basically, that's what happens. You take the full program in 12 months. You start in January, you finish in December. There are no semesters. We don't have a traditional terms, winter term, summer term, that kind of stuff. Um, it's all like one cohort. Everyone takes the same courses. You can't pick and choose what courses. If you decide to leave the program for whatever reason or leave a team, then you leave that entire cohort. You won't be allowed to join again until the following year. Uh, Diraj, explain the regular class format for in-campus format. Is it likely daily class or like you showed only on specific days? So. It is that this program, the MMA program, is designed for working professionals. So the expectation is that the majority of the students in the classroom will be working Monday to Friday, um, let's say eight to five, right? So these classes, the in-person classes will start, for example, Wednesday night at 5.30. So it gives enough time people go from the office to the classroom, and then they do class every Wednesday night from 5.30 to 9.30. And then on weekends, again, every other Saturday, but for a full day. And so you'll take one class on the Wednesday night and you'll have another class or another course on the Saturday as well. So for the Wednesday nights, because you've only got the four hours, right? You're taking every single week, you're going to be taking that course. On Saturdays, you're, there's two classes going on. So you're taking a full course there every other week. So uh, Michelle's asking, when will the application start? So the, the programs, uh, it's open now. Applications are open now. Um, for the blended program, we are pretty close to half full or half enrolled already uh, with a lot of applicants in the, in the pipeline. So again, um, you know, start quickly. Uh, if you're interested in, in joining the January 2024 start, whether it's um, or actually you said April 2024 start. So um, yeah, so basically if you want 20, January 2024 start as quickly as possible, if you want to think about the April 2024 start, um, you have a little bit of time, but it's rolling admissions, right? So the sooner you get your stuff in, the sooner we get you into the lineup for the program. And so that's good. So uh, Michelle, I would start like right away so that um, you can get in there and secure your spot as quickly as possible. Uh, how much time on average do students spend outside the classroom? So <clears throat> I would say anywhere between 14 and 20 hours per week on your academic coursework. Um, that ebbs and flows, of course, because at the beginning of a course, you're going to have more reading to do, and towards the end of a course, you'll have more assignments to do. So that ebb and flow happens throughout the program as well. Um, the other thing there, though, is if you are not an experienced Python programmer, for example, um, you can get bogged down fairly quickly because you have to learn the course content plus you're trying to learn Python programming at the same time. So that could become very challenging for you. So that's why we always encourage people to get as much Python programming experience as you can before the program actually starts. 
because then when you're taking the course content, you're familiar with Python and you won't have any struggles and stuff. It's also, remember, it's a team-based environment, right? So there are going to be people in the program who have a lot of Python experience. So you can rely on them to help you a little bit uh, or guide you more or less, um, but you will have to write the code yourself, right? So that's going to be an important aspect of this program. So if you're new to programming, I would suggest, um, you know, getting on it right now, learning how to do Python, take some like Udemy or Coursera courses, that kind of thing get introductions to Python, and then get some data sets. There's a lot of free data on the internet these days, but you can also get some work stuff. Try to do it, try to run it, try to do some visualizations, do some fun stuff with Python, and just practice, practice, practice. Uh, if I have another master's degree, can I test out of certain classes? No, you can't. So this is what we call a cohort-based program. So what will happen is at the beginning, we're gonna put you onto a team and you do the entire program with that team. And that team will be about six to eight students and you do all the courses. Quite often our courses will um, sort of bleed into one another as well. Like when you're taking 863, going into 860 and 867, um, there's a very common theme in there. So we wanna make sure everyone takes all the courses in that cohort throughout the entire program. And again, because it's 12 months, right? It, it all goes very quickly. And also the team aspects of it, everyone kind of works together and helps one another out. And so um, you'll understand that a little bit better, but no, you cannot uh, test out of certain classes. Okay, and I think I don't have any more questions. So I think we're all set for today. Um, and we're just about at one o'clock. So that's even better. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, this will be recorded and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel probably within a week or so. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Like I said, there's my QR code for LinkedIn and there's my email address as well. So uh, thanks again for joining me and have a great day. Bye-bye.